the first thing I'm going to say to you is this is a marathon, it's not a sprint. When I remember being a first time buyer, you kind of think, oh my god, I've got to get on with it, and particularly when the press are going, oh, the house prices are going up, you must buy now, it's very, very scary out there. A lot of rubbish, by the way, uh, which you'll see in a minute. So just take your time. The right time to buy a property is when it's right for you, when it's right for your personal and for your financial circumstances, and don't let anybody tell you any different. Rushing, buying your first home and spending probably up here, hundreds of, uh, down here rather, hundreds of thousands of pounds is a bad idea. Take your time and don't let anyone push you into buying here and now. Now, at this moment in time, we have what we uh, call very scientifically in the business, a frothy market. And what that means is there's far too many buyers typically and not enough sellers out there. And therefore, it's a bit like an auction. Property goes up for sale and then a series of people beat, uh, compete for it and so prices come up. However, it all depends on where you're buying. We'll talk about that in a little bit. This is, if uh, you bought back in J J January 2000, how scary would you be to know that house prices in that year went up by 28%. 28%, right? And then we move along, and then when it came to the crash that we had in 2007, house prices fell, so people who bought in 2007, they saw their house prices fall by about 15 to 20%. And then you can see August 2014, that was we were coming out of the crash. You'd have heard, oh, the market's getting really frothy. It wasn't where I live in Nottingham, nobody, nobody could be bothered to go out and buy, to be honest. Um, we didn't see house price growth for a long time outside of London. But 2014 starts getting really exciting. And actually, on average, it's not too bad here. And there's a reason for that. London has really slowed, typically, in house prices. And I'll caveat that in a little bit, because you might feel I'm talking complete nonsense, depending on which property you're going for. And the reason for that is, some years ago, 2014 actually, the government put caps on mortgage lending. And the places that that's affecting are London, the east, places like Cambridge, and the southeast. So typically, since 2014, we are not seeing the classic house price growth in London that you've seen before. And remember I said it's, not mar it's a marathon, not a sprint. Definitely take your time here, because the forecasts for London house price growth are not anything like they were before. So do take your time, and do bear in mind that this is what house prices do. They are yo-yos. They go up and down, all right? And, that's, and that will always happen. You can't control that which is why it's about your personal circumstances, your financial circumstances, that's when it's right to, to the right time to buy. Whether it's at the top of the market or the bottom, it kind of doesn't matter because you can't influence that. So the important thing is, is that although you're getting, you're getting your first property and you're thinking, oh, I've got to get this right. I've got to get this right. No, you don't. Okay? Because this is your first step on the ladder. Right? And the biggest thing you've got to do is just stay on it. Right? Lots of people bought in 2007, terrified, because two years later their house price had dropped or flat price had dropped by 15 to 20%. It didn't affect most of them at all. It happens, and we're actually really bad as an industry at predicting it as well. Uh, and we're even worse since the pandemic, uh, by the way. So the most important thing to remember is if house prices fall, and I want to take away that fear, because I know it, it exists, is there's always going to be a cost of putting a roof over your head. And you can't predict it anyway. So you either stay renting and you're paying out that money to put a roof over your head, or you're staying with mum and dad. Any mums and dads here today who are brave to come out? Well, we know the costs of having children staying with you, don't we? And you'd really rather them out. So there we go, they've got lots of nodding at the front here. And even if you are uh, prices do fall, you're still paying off that mortgage because you'll be on a repayment. That's not didn't happen in the past, and so that's why there's some more scarier stories in the past than we have today. And typically, just over time, if you hang on to that property long enough, and if you stay there for long enough, then that price will recover. And London is by far the fastest place to recover. We're in my neck of the woods, it took us. Uh, on average, 10 years for prices to recover from the 2007 to 9 crash. Here it took about four, four and a half years. So you're in a very, very safe place from that perspective. So it's only an issue if you have to remortgage, and it's an only issue if you're a force to sell. And so that that doesn't happen to you, talk to your mortgage broker. If there's something that worries you, speak to your mortgage broker and say, 
what can you do for me? How can you protect me if house prices fall and I need to sell because I've lost my job or because I get sick? And there's things that they can do to protect you. There's other things that you can do is you could potentially let that home out. Now, I know some of you might be buying with uh, Help to Buy, for example. And on the Help to Buy scheme, you can let out a room if you have one spare. And actually, that can, be, that can be quite lucrative, so bear that in mind. So there are things that you can do to protect yourself. And that's, that's basically what everybody did who lost money in 2007-9. And they're all okay today. In fact, they're all very happy because the house price has now doubled. So they're, they're happy guys. So, as I mentioned, the just make sure you're not forced to sell. Talk, that's your mortgage broker. They're the person that can help you uh, to make sure that you're protected. And if you can't pay the mortgage for any reason, mortgage lenders have much stricter regimes than they have in the past to look after you. Back in my day when I bought, it was well scary because in the 90s we had 70,000, 80,000 repossessions. Whereas now, I think even over the last recession, it's down to about 45,000. And that's because mortgage lenders have really learned that they, it's better to keep you in that property. It's very expensive for everybody to repossess. So there's lots of things that they can do to help you. And the other thing to really remember when you're buying your first home, uh, does anybody know the average age we all live to now? Sorry, fellas, you don't live quite as long. <laughs> so about 85 for women, 83. You'll probably buy three, four, five homes. I've kind of lost count of how many I'm on because I like buying houses. So this is your first step on the ladder. This is the one that you want to get on there, stay on there for five to ten years, and then you'll be looking for your next place. And it might not be, to, it was four houses before I got my dream, dream property. And I had to move out of London to do that. Okay? But I'm still only just over an hour's commute, even though I'm hundreds of miles away. So just remember, this is a lifetime that you're moving into of home ownership. And I think that makes it that little bit less scary. I hope it does anyway. Other thing is, is please, please, please get organised. There's a report recently from On The Market and it said that about 30% of people were shopping for homes and they had no idea, they hadn't spoken to a mortgage broker. That is utter stupidity, quite frankly. I can't put it in more plain terms than that and I'm not sitting on the fence. Your first port of call, even if it's three, in, three years in advance of when you want to buy, is to sit and talk to a mortgage broker to understand how much you can afford uh, a property for. So it's really important that you understand what all the steps are, because there's lots of them. And you can't be, expect even I can't remember what they all are at every single stage, so I have them all written down. And that's one of the reasons that I work with First Home Coach. They have made getting organised incredibly easy. Okay, and I've gone through every single thing that they've done. They do something, I think you call it an app. Uh, it's trendy youngsters like yourselves will completely understand. So I think that's clever. Uh, and you can do it all from your phone. And I love a checklist. Who likes checklists? I love a checklist. Uh, and that is the most important thing. Okay, there's a process. How many people have been on a project at work? Yeah, you've all got a job to do. You're, you're in charge of your buying project and you've got to have that checklist of what to do and you've got to understand who's the best person to do it for you. And the other thing that you've got to understand is that cheap in this market is bad. Who would like to go and have their leg amputated by the cheapest surgeon? Not fancying it for me. And it's exactly the same in this game. Cheap legals, cheap surveys are not good news for anybody. You want to spend on that. You want to make sure you get somebody that's progressing your file, as we call it, rather than somebody that just sits there and waits for everybody else to do it for you. So, and what these guys have done, and I know the companies they're working with, is you can get any service you want. You've got your checklist. You can set your goals of saving. So it doesn't matter if you're on the start of your journey. It doesn't matter if you're about to make an offer or you're about to book your removals. They'll help you every step of the way. And they've got a great knowledge library um, which goes through if it, you want to check out your credit score, if you want to book your removals, whatever it is, it's there. And if they haven't got something because they naughtily missed it, you can email in and Sue and I will write it for you. All right? So that's not bad. Or even do a video. I've done some of those in my time. Now, the other thing, which I think is probably one of the most exciting things to tell you today, is that I'm an order property expert. But guess what? I'm not actually that clever. And you will all soon become property experts. 
and here's why. So, how many have heard all of the media reports saying double-digit double house price growth? Yeah, and everything's rocketing away. What rubbish, outrageous. Um, so this is, this data comes from the land registry, which is government data that they collect when you sell a house, okay? What this tells you is that the first column, it says, let's look at London. So it says, since the last peak of the market, and for those of you in business, you always look at how we're we doing now versus the peak of the market. We don't do that in property, and I think it's really stupid, okay? So you look at London, London has absolutely rocketed. It's not a surprise, there's a lot of international money comes here, and there's a lot of rich people that live here, more so than in Nottingham, which is why your prices here have gone up more than mine. But not for every property, as you'll see in a bit. Um, year on year, your house prices have gone up, on average, 6%. Some have in some boroughs gone up by double digit, and in other areas they've fallen quite dramatically over the last 12 months. Not something the media will tell you, but you have 32 Lund boroughs in London, and not a surprise, they all perform completely differently. Okay? Now, what I find more interesting is, well, is that 6% a big jump, or is that what I'd normally expect? And if I take house prices back to 2005, and there's a long reason and a whole other presentation about why 2005, but it's the best year to take. Actually, on average here, if you take the average price today back to 2005, house prices in London go up by about 5% every year. Interestingly, Savills are forecasting they go up by 7% this year, and then 1 to 2 or half a percent over the next five years. So we're not expecting London to really rock it, and that's because you're hitting this price cap that the government has put with regards to mortgages, which is a good thing. So it's really important to understand that we do see over time there is a correlation, there is some sort of, uh, London will always do better than all the other regions, but typically, it's a bit like a big wave. Think of the market as a big wave. If it's a big wave, you're going to get a little bit of a smaller one. Yeah, and that's, that's how it works. And what's really important is that this happens to every single property on every single street. And this is why you will become a better property expert in two weeks of looking for a property than me if you know the right data to look for. You look at the marketing price that goes on the portals, that's interesting. But what's of more interest to me is I would then go into each individual property that I was looking at on each individual street and guess what? Free of charge, we get 20 years worth of what happened to the price of those properties on that street. And that's why you become an expert. Because two bed, two bed flats, for example, in the area that you're looking in your price bracket might be falling in price. One bed might be rising. I don't think so, not in London, there's a bit of a problem selling one bed. So if you fancy a bit of a bargain, go out and have a look at a one bed. Because you can get a good deal on them. And you can see, now they might own Lordship Close, that's obviously quite a lot of money. But there's hardly any rise in that property in London, despite all the stats I've just shown you, over a is that four, that's four, five year period. Yeah, I usually use a calculator, so that's why I'm a bit slow. Uh, and on the next one, you can see that one on, in Brentwood, that's almost dub that's doubled in value. And then you see at the next one, that's fallen in value. So all that matters when you're looking for property is you having a look at the marketing price and you having a look at the sole property prices. And a trick is if you have a look, you can see on Western Elms, that goes back to 2001. If you can find on a street what happens to a property between 2007 and 2013, you'll have a little bit of an idea of how badly or how well it reacted in the last recession. Some properties fell by 10%. Some properties didn't fall at all. Some properties fell by 60%, particularly overpriced flats in Nottingham, where I'm from, that still have not recovered their value from 14 years ago. So it's all, it's all down to you. Totally ignore what the media are telling you. They're into averages. They want big headlines. And everybody in the media believes that scary, scary headlines in property mean that they will be able to sell more advertising. And you really need to remember that because a lot of the stuff we hear is nonsense. Okay. So this is how you become a property expert, and it's really worth doing, it's so eye-opening. So research the properties for sale you want and their marketing price, understand the local market for your particular property, and understand too that one bed flats, two bed flats, three bed houses, two bed terraces could all be going in completely different directions because it's all dependent on that local supply and demand. 
And only really you and your agent and your agents you're talking to can understand that. Nobody else can tell you. So it's all down to you to do that. Check how they've sold over time. Are you on a good road? Do they sell often? So I was talking to a lady today and said that she, uh, we were talking about it would be better to buy a house than a flat. That is fairly standard moving forward. It's not new. This wasn't a pandemic thing. This has been going on since 2007. Houses typically, not everywhere, but will hold their value better. And you can then know, are you on a road, for example, where houses only come up five, every five years? In which case, the chance of you buying on that road are very little, but maybe two roads down there every two years and you have a chance. So it's lovely data and it's all free of charge. We get very excited about this, by the way. You might not share our excitement, but do share the, the, the need to do it. And see how fast properties are selling. And this is why, I, if I look, I would say to you, look two years out, if you're looking to see what's happening to a market. I look, if I'm a buyer, I will be looking a year before I want to buy. Okay, and I know what I'm doing and I know what to look for, but I would never dream of buying a property or making an offer until I'd watched that market for a good year. Okay. And then research the agents that are selling your types of properties. So here in London, you'll probably have a hundred that you might think you have to keep in touch with, but probably about 10, 15 or 20 of them will actually be selling your kind of properties. Okay, so you can focus in on that a little bit more. And the agents that are selling are the ones that will have a better idea of what's happening in the market. If somebody is an agent is selling a property and they have no other ones for sale and they haven't sold them in the last year, they won't really understand what's happening in the market. So the first one is, as I've mentioned before, start two years early. And if you're in the process now, just catch up doing some of the research that I've spoken about. That's absolutely fine. Understanding your affordability and things like your credit score, absolutely imperative. And just think, it, it does all feel, and I know I've spoken to people today, that it is all overwhelming. Just think of that project you were on, and you just did everything at a step at a time. And your first job is understand what can you afford, and then understand the kind of areas that you want to look at. So you understand your affordability, that's talking to a mortgage broker. Some mortgage brokers won't be interested if you're a few years out. Most of them will be very keen to talk to you because they can explain all the things that you need to know so that by the time you turn up at the door, you're their best customer. And they can spend their time, rather than educating you on what you needed to do or should have done, they can spend their time finding the best mortgage for your circumstances. Okay, so really, really important to do that and understand your credit score. Know those prices and differences. It's, it's quite hard in London because there's so many different places you can live. So what I tend to do is I kind of think, I used to do relocation for a lot of companies, we do huge relocation here for BP. Um, they, interestingly, they moved everybody out of London and then they wanted to move them back in. That wasn't an easy conversation with their staff, I promise you, but we made that life easier. And it's about what are the places that you go to every day? Your work? Maybe, maybe not. Maybe that doesn't matter now. It might be the gym, it might be seeing your friends, it might be seeing your family. So just plot where they all are and work out what are the best routes. Is it best to go on a tram line, for example? Um, is it better to go on uh, the northern line or whatever? Or is it better on a train route? And then what I used to do when I was here, I just used to look to see at what some of the house prices were in those areas online. But then I would literally get on the train and I would just train, train stop. I'd go from one stop to the other. Because one thing you cannot do, there's lots of amazing things you can do online, you cannot know whether a property is right for you or not online. Please don't think you can reject properties online. You can't. You have to walk the streets. You have to get a feel for an area. It's really important because you might think, so for example, I bought in Croydon. I've got uh, my cousin's daughter is buying there now and my niece has just bought there with her partner. Lots of people won't think Croydon's horrible. And parts of Croydon are truly horrible. <laughs> but there are streets in Croydon and around Croydon which are brilliant. There are some streets which aren't fantastic, but they're affordable, and my word, the transport system there is about the best you could wish for in London. So think about that. You've got to kind of make all of these kind of guesses and assumptions of what's right for you. So it's about trying to find the best area for you. And if uh, another good one that I had was somebody said, I want to live in Windsor. Anybody here like to live in Windsor? I'd hate to live in Windsor, quite frankly, because for anybody in Windsor, the traffic is awful. Absolutely awful. So I say to people, right, why do you want to live in Windsor? 
And they'll say, well, the reason I want to do that, Kate, is oh, I just love the restaurants. <laughs> and I love the shopping. And I'm like, oh, my word. That's so not me. Uh, and I'm like, fine, so you're going to go out every night? No. <laughs> we do Friday, Saturday, and lunch at home on Sunday with family. And I go, to two nights, you're going to go out in Windsor, and you're going to pay 100 grand more for that property rather than just take a taxi. Suddenly the penny drops. So that's the kind of thing you've got to think about. Just really kind of, um, you know, as I say, you won't in your first home typically buy the best house that you want. It, that you want. it won't be your ideal home. But it's a step on the ladder that then will allow you to get to the next property and to the next property. It took me four to get to where I really wanted to be. And then I had to leave London because I either decided to stay here, earn 150 grand to get the property I want. Do you know what? I would have had no life. So I decided to jump up north. Uh, I live halfway between Bradford and New in, in a little village in the perfect house that I want. And it takes me an hour and a half or so to get to London. But I don't have to travel here. Obviously, I haven't travelled here for two years, so that's an experience. <laughs> um, do use the qualified surveyor. Even if you're buying a new build, for example. Um, the, the rest of, there is some really good stuff coming up on New Build, hopefully next year, where you're getting an ombudsman and you'll be able to do what they call have a snagging checklist, which if you're looking at buying uh, next year is really, really going to make a big difference, because at the moment some developers won't allow you to do that. Developers work very hard to build quality properties. It is really difficult to build quality properties. Okay? If you, for example, and I'm, I'm, really, I'm classic at this, you know when you do the washing up, or your other half does the washing up, because it's easier to check someone else's work, isn't it? <laughs> you will find there's things they've missed, haven't they? And it's quite irritating. But I live by myself, and I irritate myself with this. <laughs> now imagine building a whole house with teams of people going in. And I'll tell you a little secret. One site got devastated because, turned out, site manager's wife was going out with the plumber. <laughs> I'm not joking. This stuff happens. So it's really important, whether you're buying a new build or anything else, make sure you have a proper survey on that property um, and the appropriate one. I don't tend to go with a surveyor that the lender recommends. So the lender will send somebody out for evaluation and they might say to you, trade up and you can get a home buyer survey and a building survey. I'm not a fan of that because typically, and you can talk to the lender about this, sometimes they do do a fair job, but they'll tend to target them on the number that they have. And I like my own independent surveyor that's going to go out, works for me, I've paid for them, even if I have to pay for evaluation as well. Because then I can ask them all the questions I want. And I would always recommend speaking to a surveyor and asking if you could come with them at the last 15, 20 minutes. Don't follow them around for three hours, it's creepy. <laughs> but if you go the last 15 to 20 minutes, that's fine. And understand about some of the things they've maybe picked up, why they're worrying, why they're not. And always, always, whether we're with your legal company and indeed with your surveyor, if there's anything that worries you or frightens you that you see, make sure they know that beforehand so that they can check it out and hopefully allay your fears. Okay. One thing, and I hadn't actually thought of saying this to people before because I'm so used to it, um, I never realised how much of a problem it was so recently. Um, you know when you get to exchange, that's like a big happy moment. Definitely get the fizz out, whatever it is you want. Um, then it doesn't happen. It will probably, on average, take you two or three goes to get to exchange. It's extraordinarily irritating. But the reason is, you remember that file I told you that the conveyors have, the legal companies have? What happens on exchange day, somebody goes through that in the morning and says, do you know what, we've done 52 out of the 53 things, but we forgot to ask for this. And that's why your first exchange will fall out. The next week, the other solicitor will go, well, actually, I know they're ready now because they've done all their 53 things, but actually we've missed two things. And they'll come back to that. It happens two or three times pretty much for every property I've bought, um, even when we do it professionally, so bear that in mind. And the other thing is, this is my biggest bugbear, are any of you planning a holiday in the next 12 months? Put your hand down now. <laughs> Every time I buy a property, the buyer goes on holiday and I can't complete when we want to. And what the reason being is because they don't put the deposit in the legal company's account in time to complete. And now they're in France. And I'm sitting there and going, I haven't gone on holiday because I didn't want to upset my completion time. And now they've messed me around and they're enjoying selling themselves on the beach. This is not right. So please, for my sake, 
Do not, do not go on holiday. It's a nightmare. I hate it. Um, the other one is searches. This is a really, I do a lot with um, government and a lot with uh, the industry, and we really try to get these done by the seller, which is what my preference would be. But as a buyer, you are responsible for ordering the searches. Now, some legal companies, and I completely understand why, don't order searches until they've got your mortgage approved and until the survey has said this property is okay. The reason they're trying to do that is they're trying to save you 150, 250 quid. In my view, it is not worth it because there may be something in those searches that means that you don't buy the property, right? And as a result, we know from data that's been done that people that delay getting their searches weeks past the offer has been accepted, the chance of your sale falling through is much higher. And it's a scary stat. So for every offer you make, one in three of those offers accepted will fall through. And one of the reasons is people aren't, don't get the searches done early and it collapses the sale. So for me, and it is your choice, day of instruction, I ask them to go and get the searches. Okay. So and I say to them, no, I want to spend the money because I don't want the worry um, of um, you know, going through all the mortgage, going through the survey, only to find six weeks, eight weeks down the line, something's gone wrong and I don't want to buy that property anymore. So do that. Um, and then, uh, how many of you are renting currently? Okay, check your tenancy agreement. I have to say, I do work on the renting side. Did you know that over the last 12 months during COVID, there have been 47 changes to the letting law, of which most of them are on landlord evictions and the changes to your, how long you tell the landlord you've got to leave for. So get your contract out, really understand how long a time you have to give, the, um, have to give your landlord or your letting agent. Uh, so make sure you understand that to the very, very day, because that can save you some money. Um, and look after you. And also, two little things on that. Firstly is, um, clean your oven. Don't clean it to your standard, because that's the biggest reason for complaints by landlords. Clean it to mum's standard, dad's standard, or somebody that likes cleaning ovens, even if you don't. Okay, so a little tip there, that can save yourself a hundred pounds. And sometimes in your agreement, you will have not remembered five years ago that you signed up to have a professional cleaner. Because that goes in the contract. So remember those, those are the two reasons why this all goes horribly wrong. When you're buying a house, you do not want to have all of these works around your, uh, uh, around your neck. And the other thing is, I'm going to tell you a little story about moving your own stuff. So, a friend of mine is a broker, uh, and uh, she was telling us a great story. Couple, moving into their first flat, very excited, thought it was a good idea to carry the sofa one flight up the stairs. So for Fell, he broke his back. Two worries, how were they going to pay the mortgage? And secondly, how are they going to survive while he was in hospital for the next six months? All that to save three or four hundred quid on a van, man with a van. Yes, if you've got a car full of stuff, and if you have no heavy furniture, and you're not moving upstairs, fine. But think about it. The good news story in this case was the broker had got insurance for job loss and sickness, and despite the fact that this couple hadn't even paid the first premium, they were covered and kept their home. But please don't, we all look, and I completely understand why, how do we save money? You're spending hundreds of thousands. Please look after your backs, your knees. It can make a massive difference. It's not always a great saving, okay? And you'll probably need two van loads rather than one, just in my experience, okay? Um, and you don't want to be moving at 8 o'clock at night. It's rubbish. Uh, so really think twice about whether you're going to save money or not. Um, and then the final thing is, please, please, please review your mortgage really regularly. So you're in your home, you're loving it, and you're like, I never want to speak to a legal company, a surveyor, I hate mortgages. I don't want anything to do with them. Did you know that every three months, lenders review their products, and they review their prices? And what if in six months' time, a corker of a deal comes through? which might mean that it's better you cashing in. When you're paying a mortgage and you get a better deal, we're not talking a few hundred quid saving like you do with you switch or whatever it is. We're talking thousands, if not tens of thousands of pounds. So the mortgage broker you choose today, is, that is your person for life, and you want to stick with them because, for example, um, they go through, hey, is anybody self-employed? Yes. Yeah? Sometimes, the government, sometimes lenders are really anti-self-employed. 
and they'll put real big restrictions on what you can um, what you can borrow. And sometimes they then let those restrictions go when they're a little bit more comfortable. So really important that you always keep up with your mortgage broker and review your mortgage regularly.